we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our, our objective, I guess, is to understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's habits so that we actually influence our own, right? And so that's the point behind uh, our ICOIG, Islamic Center of Ashura Youth Group, bring up uh, this series, Lessons from the Best of Creation, right? That uh, we are able to connect with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and learn from them, right? And be able to take lessons from it. So that's why it's called lessons, right? Um, and so uh, the choice that, uh, that, our young, that our youth group made, mashallah, was a very interesting and amazing one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, right? Um, mashallah, the youth group operates and they, uh, out of the masjid at the Islamic Center of Ashwa, and they try to connect regularly and they uh, conduct all of these programs as you heard about, mashallah. And so in Ramadan, mashallah, they came up with this thought of how do we uh, you know, continue with some some effort, uh, some something that could uh, benefit ourselves and the young people, and so this uh, idea of uh, of the lessons that we can that uh, that we can attain from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then um, specifically these different discussions. So uh, the first of these being the daily habits of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, obviously with Ramadan, it's very challenging to find time to do enough research, um, even though. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a noble act to try and do this research, but to find the time with, uh, you know, with classes and with other classes that I teach and, uh, and also recitation of the Quran, um, I was fortunate enough that, uh, you know, some of the work on these topics are done uh, in a way that we could benefit from. This is a book that you can see on screen over here. It's called Al Yawm Nabawi, the Day of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's an Arabic book. It's written in Arabic. I actually have the book in PDF form. Um, and I'd be happy to share it if somebody can read it in Arabic. Um, so uh, this actually covers the daily life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then uh, basically what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. And so um, from that, uh, there was a nice article that I found and I'm going to use the article itself uh, to benefit us with, um, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daily routine. And so I know that the, the topic was to try and understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daily habits so that we can, uh, especially in Ramadan. But when it comes to discussing the Prophet Sallallahu daily habits in Ramadan, then we have to understand that it comes alongside with the Prophet Sallallahu daily habits on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and what we're going to learn is that the day of the Prophet Sallallahu in Ramadan was, an, was molded off of the day that he normally kept, right? His daily routine. And so, uh, you know, this is an interesting article that deals with uh, from that same book, that same Arabic book that I just uh, I just pulled up, uh, Al Yawm Al Nabawi, right? Um, uh, written by uh, uh, a scholar from Makkah Al Mukarramah, Abdul Wahab bin Nasir Al Tariri, right? Uh, from his book, um, this article has been put together, and so uh, because I had a chance to be able to read the entire book uh, in Arabic uh, before, so that's why you know I was able to understand. Mashallah, see that the article does does uh, is put together well. Um, it's uh, by a uh, by a website known as Productive Muslim, which is an interesting website and it always has uh, some general, some uh, some good topics that they cover, how to be a productive Muslim. So I'm going to use the article written by Muhammad al-Faris um, on the daily routine of the Prophet wasallam and cover that and then add to that in regards to the, the habits of Ramadan. And then after that, if there's, uh, if there's some questions that anybody has, inshallah, we can try to answer those. So he starts the, the article in a very interesting way. So if you can see the article on the screen, uh, for those of you that are uh, through the Zoom, I know that uh, I've uh, decided to take the liberty of go Instagram Live. Um, and so if you, um, you know, on the Instagram Live, you might not be able to see the actual um, the, the screen. But uh, I'll read it anyway. It says, he starts by quoting um, a, 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 a quote from Michael H. Hart's, uh, H. Hart's book, The Hundred, a, hun a ranking of the most influential persons in history. And um, if we don't know that Michael H. Hart had actually ranked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he's not a Muslim, Michael H. Hart, and his book is a famous book, um, and he ranked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be number one. The most influential person in the entire history, according to him, was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's interesting alongside with this was that there's another study in a, um, that uh, I, I was able to find, which they ranked 500 people, the 500 most influential people uh, throughout history or throughout time, something of that nature. And that, um, that uh, was a separate study, and that also chose the Prophet ﷺ to be the most influential person. So it's interesting that we had two independent studies, both of whom ranked the Prophet ﷺ as the most influential person in the entire history. Um, so when we're talking about 
taking lessons from the best of creation, this is a very fascinating way to start the discussion because, you know, we are talking about the person that non that Muslims, you know, Muslims should be seeing as an influential person for sure. But even studies, out, uh, you know, outside of the, the the faith of Islam, have shown that the Prophet sallallahu was the most influential pe person. So uh, the excerpt from uh, Michael H. Hart's book, he uh, he says, my choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some re readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular levels. Right, so um, that's interesting, right? Because when we're trying to learn from him, you know, many a times we only see the Prophet sallallahu from the perspective of, uh, in the lens of, of religion. And we think, okay, well, how did the Prophet sallallahu behave, you know, as a, as a Muslim when it, when it came to his worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But uh, for the non-Muslim, it's surprising that they also find him, found him as the most influential person, even on a secular level, even though the word secular uh, can be, uh, uh, you know, can be a debated word. Um, but, you know, uh, and generally it's given uh, the meaning that uh, absence of religion and uh, not, not being religious and everything to, besides religion. But really, um, you know, that when you, when you're, when, and that's the way that it's been used over here, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, you know, not just for this person, a, a, a person who was successful as a religious figure, as a relig person of religion, but also in terms of his general life, right? And so uh, he says, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one, it was one of the most revered and influential persons in history, yet arguably the most misunderstood as well. He would surely fit within, with the misfits of uh, descriptions of Steve Jobs. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. He was a man whose life was recorded in minute detail and today billions follow in his footsteps in the way they dress, eat and sleep. Yet his life lessons are rarely translated to be made relevant to our modern day challenges. He was a man who lived the best version of himself, yet many people who claim to follow him rarely reflect this best image of him. They have this poster and I have this poster. Um, so uh, I will present that inshallah. In this article, our purpose is to translate the daily routine of, Muhammad, of the Prophet ﷺ into a practical guide that will not only let you see the beauty and relevance of his life to your life, but be, will become a blueprint for the habits and routines you need to adapt in your life to live the, live the best version of yourself, spiritually, physically, and socially. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا the best the messenger of, of Allah is an example as an excellent example for those of you who put your hope in Allah and the last day and remember him often so why should I follow the routine of a man who lived 1400 years ago our daily habits and routines make a huge difference whether we live the best versions of ourselves or not and one of the challenges each one of us face is choosing the habits and routines that work for us and that over a lifetime. That over a lifetime help us live a meaningful and impact, impactful life. After all, each one of us wants to achieve success in life and no one wants to be a failure. The question is, what are these habits and routines and which ones will guarantee that we'll live a productive, productive meaningful life? Usually the quick answer is to look up successful contemporary people and try to copy their habits and routines. Just Google the term habits of, su habits of successful people and you'll see, you'll see millions of search results with articles and books on what, to do, what, what do successful people do that most of us fail to do. But there are three is issues with this approach. Number one, pseudo truth. We only see the part of their routine that they allow us to see. And we don't know the person as a whole, i.e. what are their habits and routines when they are lazy and having a bad day. Number two, one dimensional. Most of the habits routines highlighted are work related routines and we rarely see spiritual, physical or social routines highlighted. Number three, the 1%. Most modern day successful people have a leg up on the social ladder and are starting off from the solid social economic base or live in centers of civilization that allow them opportunities to prosper. Think of all the su su successful Silicon Valley interpreter, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. It's hard to imagine some of them succeeding at the scale they did if they started from the slums of an impoverished nation. Contrary to the above, the Prophet ﷺ was a, a successful person uh, across all areas of life. This is not by my account, by the state, but by the statement of many historians and biographers throughout history. B, his life was recorded in detail by his family, friends, and even enemies. And hence, we see him in the most intimate moments as well as public moments. See, he was successful despite being born in the deserts of Arabia, 
away from the Roman Byzantine center of centers of culture and civilization. C uh, or E, I'm oh, sorry, D. An Arafan whose uh, father died before he was born and mother died at the age of six, living poor for most of his life. E, he was successful with his mission despite the odds stacked against him and many and losing many of his family members and friends due to his message. Next point. He is loved and revered by over a billion people today and his message survived over 1,400 years. So now are you intrigued to know more about his daily routine? Do you ever, do you wonder what those small decisions he made every day and how it led him to, uh, to, to what he became? <clears throat> yes, so the you know, common you know, uh, reply could come. Yes, he lived in a desert. It was simple back then and he didn't have Facebook. One of the, mod one of the ironies of modern life is although we have progressed uh, with our technologies, we've regressed in our humanity. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We've created guided missiles but misguided humanity. We think that because we live in the 21st century, in modern buildings with modern amenities and technologies a touch away, we're somehow a different breed or a separate human species from, uh, from people who came before us, and therefore their lifestyle does not apply to ours, and their habits and routines are beneath us. However, when we look closely into their lives, we'll notice that they face the same challenges we face. The challenge, is, uh, challenge of finding meaning and purpose in life, balancing between their various roles, being successful in their endeavors, maintaining relationships, and leaving a legacy to be remembered. They loved, bled, cried, laughed, and lived their humanity, and left us an example, uh, and left an example for us through their stories and example, examples. And what better story to follow and learn from than the, than the story of a man who walked, who according to his wife was a walking, breathing Quran. Right, so Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned this about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was asked by the uh, uh, by uh, by her nephew uh, or another companion that uh, uh, can you describe the character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And she said, "Kana khuluquhu al Quran." That his character was the Quran. And so, uh, you know, when we say uh, when we say uh, when she said his character was the Quran, you can't actually go into the Quran and find. Oh, here's the character of the Prophet ﷺ listed point by point, bullet by bullet, or verse by verse. We don't find that. So how do we know what, what we mean by, um, you know, what, when she says that his character was a Qur'an, what do we actually mean by that, right? The meaning to that is actually that you're going to find all so many verses of the Qur'an talking about good character. And all of those good characteristics were in the Prophet ﷺ, and not just in the Prophet ﷺ, but to the highest degree, um, you know, and so... And similarly, there are uh, you know, characteristics condemned by the Qur'an. The Qur'an says, speaks evil about them, talk, mentions them to be bad characteristics, and all of those were absent in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They, were, they weren't in the, fine, uh, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Right, so we can go on. Fine, but he was a prophet, someone special. I'm not special. Let me ask you this. How do you think special people become special? Isn't it through their ha daily habits and routines? And as for, and for prophets, their habits and routines were divinely inspired, which makes them even more vital to emulate to help us live the best version of ourselves. Are you ready now to delve deeper into the de detailed breakdown of the Prophet wasallam's routine? Um, read this article with an open mind and an open heart, and it may change the way you live your life forever. Preamble. Before we begin, there are a few essential points to keep in mind as you read this article. Number one, using the word routine might not be the best description of a typical day in the Prophet ﷺ's life. As you will read below, he used to adapt each day to the needs of his family and community and did not follow a strict 9 to 5 routine. Having said that, you'll see a clear structure of his, uh, for his days, mostly surrounding prayer times, and never was a moment wasted or not utilized at its best. And that's important because sometimes, you know, we, have, we live in a world in which we have, you know, uh, I mean, now with the pandemic situation, it's a little bit difficult and more, more tough. But, uh, you know, speaking generally, you know, we have this so-called routine. You wake up and you do this and then you do that and you, and, and you have school and then you, you know, if you're working, you, have, uh, you work from this time to that time. And so, you know, the Prophet ﷺ had the ability to adapt, right? And still use all of his time and not mess his schedule up. That's amazing. Number two, the foundational piece of understanding the Prophet ﷺ's routine is his famous saying, I was sent to perfect good character. So every decision and choice he made regarding how he spent his time, who he spent it with, and, how, and what he did on a day-to-day -day basis comes back to this foundational piece. So you can see, so see if you can notice this thread as you read this article. The Prophet Sallallahu primary mission and role in, in life were to save humanity by inviting them to the way of God. That was his full-time occupation. He was also a father, grandfather, husband, father-in-law, brother-in-law, uh, you know, a leader of the community. And they, you know, the list can go further. 
right? It's more, much more than that. It's more extensive than that. The fact that he was the head of state, right? The governor of Medina, um, you know, the, the leader of all, and after the conquest of Mecca, he was the, the, the leader of all of, the, uh, of all of Arabia, right? The entirety of Arabia was under him, right? And so uh, that's, you know, a lot of governing to do, right? Just governing your, uh, you know, the, the people, uh, is interesting. And one of the most interesting elements to his life that uh, I know is not written here and I'm interjecting with, with my own thoughts is that he was able to relate to the, to, the small, to the small child, to the poor person and to the rich person and to the adult and to the mature, and, uh, mature, mature person in exactly the same way. Meaning that, you know, he had time for a child. Right? You know this famous story of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu, a young, uh, you know, the, the cousin brother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who he, he gives him a ride and he actually uh, teaches him some words and he memorizes those words and then he relays those words to us, right? Uh, you know, and similarly, you know, uh, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu once wants to see how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's night habit was. So his, his aunt Maymuna radiallahu anha was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she, he asks her, can I come and sleep by, at your house the day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes and sleeps there so I can see how he behaves at night and uh, she asked uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says yes and he comes and sleeps the night there. So he's, he has time for kids that want to learn by him. But he has time for Abu Bakr radiallahu who's two years younger than him, right? And, and going to be the next leader after, of the Muslims after him. And he has time for Umar radiallahu anhu. And then he has time for an insane, uh, you know, a woman who had a mental disability in Medina that she would want to try and ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam things and he would, be able, he would allow her to, to speak to him privately, to speak to him uh, in a way that, uh, that other people would, wouldn't be able to hear. And so he had time for this. Despite the fact that he's the leader of all of Arabia, like you're talking about the pre president or prime minister or the governor, right, the statesman. So you have to keep all that in mind when we're talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Again, keep this in mind as you read about his day-to-day -day routines. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him in the, in the Qur'an, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And indeed you, O Messenger of Allah, are upon the, uh, upon, uh, the greatest, right? Ala, uh, are upon the greatest of moral character. Below we describe the Prophet ﷺ's daily routine based on a typical day during the latter part of his life. So now keep in mind, when we talk about the daily habits of the Prophet ﷺ, we have to keep in mind that the Prophet ﷺ's uh, life can be split into three eras. Right? Uh, actually, if we want to say two eras, we can say two eras. One was before prophethood and one is after prophethood. So before prophethood is from, uh, from his infancy until, uh, until the age of 40. And then after 40, he be, at, at the age of 40, he becomes a prophet. And then from 40 until 63 is, uh, is the second era of his life. And then in that era of, of, pro of prophethood, right, we can split his life into two further eras. It can make it into sub-eras. Right? One is uh, his life in Mecca and the other is, in, is his life in Medina. And so, um, you know, his uh, Makkan life, um, you know, and because until he doesn't get to Medina, there is this constant, you know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu having to constantly be involved in doing da'wah. And so, you know, we find a little bit about his life mentioned. And I will mention, uh, you know, hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of, uh, that's mentioned about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's mentioned by Imam Bukhari in his Sahih, under the first chapter, which is Kitabul Iman, the chapter on Iman on faith. And under there, the fourth hadith of the Prophet uh, of, of Imam Bukhari Sahih is the hadith in which uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, uh, you know, describing the first wahi in revelation. And he comes back to the, uh, and the narrator is Aisha radiallahu anha. And he comes back after he gets the first revelation, which takes place in Ramadan, by the way, on the night of power in Laylatul Qadr, right? Allah, Allah mentions that in the Quran, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr, that we uh, revealed uh, the, this Quran to him on the night of power. And he comes back to Khadija radiallahu anha, and he's afraid because he has never seen this, he, he is in a different state. And so he tells Khadija radiallahu anha about what's, what's happened, and he's not sure uh, as to exactly what this is at the moment, but, uh, um, you know, he, he um, and so Khadija radiallahu anha, consoles him with certain words. And those words explain some of the habits that he had. The first thing that she says, right? And she says, By Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. You always maintain ties with your relatives. You know, maintaining ties with relatives is not easy, right? Keeping your connection with your relatives proper is not easy. Uh, so, And you carry the load of, of the people that can't carry, uh, that, that, that have a load to carry. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ would go out into the streets of Mecca and when people had something that they needed to be carried, they were trying to carry it themselves, the Prophet ﷺ would carry it for them to their homes. 
وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم. And you go and get a job and you earn for that person who can't earn for themselves. Like somebody who's disabled, somebody who that has a disability, whether it's physical, mental, uh, or somebody that's, uh, that's too old to be able to earn for themselves. The Prophet Sallallahu would actually go and earn, would get a job and earn. Now remember, uh, we're talking about, you know, him getting, uh, you know, simple jobs in those days, in, in, in that circumstance. Otherwise, he was employed by Khadija radiallahu anha initially to go and trade, right? And he would travel far off to trade, right? And trade was a skill of life that was that was necessary at that time. And so, الْمَعْدُومِ You go and earn for that person who can't earn for themselves. And you take care of your guests. Because in those days, you know, people, Mecca was a center of trade, right? And people would come there and they wouldn't have places to stay. There wasn't hotels there. So the Prophet ﷺ would, uh, would honor the people that came and he would actually take them to their home, to his home and he would keep them there and feed them there and keep the, and show them hospitality. Uh, and you assist in every avenue of good. And that can be further described. There, uh, there's a, there was an instance that took place in Mecca. Uh, you know, Mecca, as we know, uh, as some of you, if you've read the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would know that, uh, you know, the, the, it was called, the, uh, the pre-Islamic era was called the days of ignorance because there was a lot of looting and killing because, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, um, you know, survival was, was challenging, right? It was a challenge to survive in those societies. And so, um, you know, uh, some people came together um, that uh, wanted to, to, to try and assist and protect the weak and the, and the, and the travelers and the, and the needy. And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was amongst them. And he went and he took part in a, in, in a pledge. It was called Hilful Fudul, the pledge of virtues, right? That took place in Makkah. And so this was part of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when we, we, you know, she's explaining, Khadija radiallahu anha, who is his wife, is explaining to us that every avenue of good you assisted. Right? So that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But now, uh, because it, like the Meccan era, the Medina era is a little is different, um, but we're going to uh, discuss the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his daily habits or his daily routine in the latter part of his life because there was, it was a bit more settled, his life was a bit more settled. So we're going to go into it. It says, the prophet, prophetic morning routine, close your eyes and imagine for a moment, you're zooming into the humble dwelling of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And it's going to start from there. Um, now, there's a lot to cover, um, but we'll try to keep it brief. Uh, for those of you that can see this picture over here, this was, uh, you know, uh, there, there was an exhibition about the Prophet Sallallahu life, and I'm going to just point the, pic, to point the camera onto, uh, hopefully, the, you can see that. Uh, this was a, 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 what, a replica of the Prophet Sallallahu home, right? This was what it was. Uh, it was done in, uh, in Jeddah, I think it was an exhibition on the Prophet Sallallahu and they actually tried to make a replica of what the Prophet Sallallahu home would look like. Um, so, um, I'm going to skip from here actually, and I'm going to actually go into, uh, because it's a little easier to see it from this, uh, uh, from this, uh, from this poster, rather than, uh, from this, uh, so forgive me, I'm just going to quickly jump to that. If you give me a quick second, and do it from here. So, all right. So now over here, this is the same thing that's going to be covered in the article, basically. Uh, and I apologize, I'm going to, oh, sorry. All right, I'm going to, Jump that chair and I'm going to go to another one. All right. Okay, so this is a bit more clear. And so you can see from here, and I'll point the picture to for those that want to, that are in the Instagram, inshallah, if you can see it. I'm not sure if you can or if it's clear. Enough. It's not going to be very clear, but I'm going to point out uh, that we're going to go over this uh, from this uh, year, inshallah. Um, so it, it's going to start from. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Fajr, right? That's where it starts from, right? The Prophet, oops, sorry. All right, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's day starts at Fajr time, right? So Fajr time would begin with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we learned one thing that was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's day was scheduled around his prayers, right? So the prayers would obviously be a way that it would schedule his time. And so uh, the Fajr prayer was going to be the first prayer Bilal radiallahu anhu, anhu was going to call out the adhan for the fajr, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was going to wake up. Now keep in mind because um, you know fajr is obviously connected to the night, and the night is going to come at the end. There is a little bit before fajr that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you know that's part of his routine because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not sleep too much at night. Right? The Quran tells us that. Uh, 
uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Muzammil, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal Muzammil, qubil layla illa qalila. Oh, you who wraps himself in a cloak, stand up for uh, the, the, the majority of the night. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that, uh, inna laka fin nahari sabhan tawila. So stand up at night and pray, and then during the day, you know, make an effort. And the effort has been described, the analogy that the, that the Quran uses to explain the type of effort the Prophet sallallahu had to make, was to swim a great deal. In the laka fin nahari sabhan tawila. In the day you have to swim a long swim, right? So swimming is a, a tiresome, uh, you know, exercise. And to swim a long distance is very tiring. And so the effort of the Prophet ﷺ in the day was, uh, the, the, the Quran uses the example of a person swimming a long distance. Uh, so continuously, you know, you can't stop. You have to continuously swim, swim, swim to get to your, to the end point, which is very far. And so the Prophet ﷺ would have to make effort. And so he would wake up at, uh, at Fajr time, and then he would use his siwak, he would express gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the elements, the daily habits of the Prophet sallallahu was his du'as. And there are du'as that are scattered, right? There are du'as of the Prophet sallallahu that he made. There were special supplications that he made at every moment in the day, right? That's interesting. That's a very fascinating element. Uh, you know, that he had supplications for what he woke up, right? Uh, um, for tahajjud, he had supplications when he woke up right after Fajr salah. Right at Fajr time, um, and then he would answer, he would go to the masjid and he would lead the people in in, in the Fajr salah. After uh, the the Fajr salah, he would turn around and he would ask the people, "Did you have? Did anybody see any dreams?" Uh, if a person had seen the dream, they would mention it to, them, to him. If the Prophet ﷺ himself saw a dream, he would mention it to the people. And then uh, he would in either interpret the dream that the other person had seen, or he would uh, mention a dream that he might have seen, or he would start conversing with the, with the people. That would be just for a few minutes. And then the Prophet ﷺ would sit and recite, uh, you know, uh, tasbihat, until, uh, until the sun had risen about approximately a spear's length from the ground, right? So approx approximately 10, 10 minutes or so after sunrise, he would stay there and then he would pray two rakat or sometimes four rakat of prayer and then he would go home. He would greet his family. Um, if there was some food to eat, then he would eat that. And if there was no food to eat, then he would say, I'm fasting, right? So uh, the, that's what the Prophet Sallallahu would do. So we're at the breakfast. And then that was when the official start of the day would begin. He would go back to the masjid, right? And, um, and, and so he, uh, he, uh, he would go back to the masjid, and then that would be a time for, uh, he would pray two rakat, and then that would be a time for a general assembly, right? A general assembly in which he would teach the people. Now remember in Medina that there was going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was going to be the people of Sufa, which were the people that didn't have a home, uh, and they were living on the western side of the masjid, uh, and there was a platform there, a, a covered platform in which they used to sleep, and they used to spend time with the Prophet sallallahu and that's how a, a, a companion by the name of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, who comes to, uh, who only spends about three and a half years to four years with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, memorizes about 5,000 ahadith because he spends that time in the assembly. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would sit and he would uh, teach the people, right? And he would teach the people and he would teach various people. And various people would come, right? And, uh, uh, and, uh, and some, some people would be learning, you know, higher studies. Some people would be learning basic um, but the Prophet Sallallahu would have time for all of that. He would also take care of social and political affairs. So in that time, the Prophet Sallallahu would deal with other issues that would, would be affecting the community, right? Uh, things like if there was a sick companion, the Prophet Sallallahu would go and visit him. If the Prophet Sallallahu had to go and do, uh, you know, uh, arbitration between two, uh, two groups of people, the Prophet Sallallahu would go and do that. Sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu would also uh, take care of uh, other political matters, right, uh, that, uh, that, that needed to come up. Um, the, the Prophet Sallallahu would take care of social matters that were within the community in that time. And so uh, from that time until uh, approximately noon time, the Prophet Sallallahu would spend that time governing the affairs of the people, teaching them and governing them, right? And so uh, that was what the Prophet Sallallahu would do. Before noon, he would also visit some of his relatives and he would walk through the Medina market. Um, and so he would he would keep an eye on uh, on the uh, on the on the economic situation of Medina as well. And so the Prophet there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ visiting the marketplace and asking uh, uh, you know a person who was selling some grains as to why these grains uh, he put his hands at the bottom of the grain and he saw that it was there was wetness at the bottom of the grain uh, uh, the pile of grains. And so that was a way that you know in the past uh, people would actually you know uh, you know wet the grain so that it would become heavier in weight. And so when they would measure the weight of the grain. 
return, the, the buyer would get less and the seller would get more, uh, would get more money in return. So the Prophet ﷺ questioned the person, why, did you, why, why is this wet at the bottom? And so, uh, you know, making sure that the person wasn't cheating in business. And so the, 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 the companion said, O Prophet of Allah, it rained last night and these grains were open and that's why, it's, uh, why it has a, uh, it's wet. And so he took care of, you know, uh, all of these elements together at the same time, right? Um, and then he would go home. Uh, some people might visit him at home uh, if there was a need. And then he would, uh, uh, he would actually spend some time with his family. And then he would actually take a little bit of a nap, right? So he had time for a nap, right? He, in, the, in the afternoon time before Dhuhr, he would take a nap. If it was Jumu'ah, then he would not eat. Uh, if he was going to have lunch or he was going to take his nap, it would not happen until after Jumu'ah. Because then he would go earlier to the, uh, the or, or he'd uh, be pre in preparation for Jumu'ah. And then after his nap, he would wake up for Dhuhr Salah. He would come to Dhuhr Salah. Sometimes he would address the congregation after prayers. Um, and, uh, and then sometimes he would also give the, uh, the companions uh, specific duty to fulfill. And um, he would uh, spend time, again, trying to deal with the, the public and, and, and uh, the, the affairs of the people and the society. And then he would um, uh, Asr prayer, he would lead the Asr prayer. And then he would, after Asr, because he had, uh, you know, our, uh, the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were nine in, in total at one time. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go to the, uh, the houses of each one of them, making sure that uh, things were fine in the home, making sure that everything was settled. There, uh, if there was any needs to be taken care of, then he would spend, uh, uh, and so he would spend some quality time with his family members between Asr, and then he would, uh, between Asr and Maghrib, he would come back at Maghrib time, lead the prayers and uh, lead the companions in prayer. And then he would go um, and, uh, he would uh, eat uh, some food if there was some food to eat. And, um, and then he would come back for the Isha prayer. So keep in mind that the, the day wasn't, uh, was a little shorter. Um, and then he would go to the masjid, uh, lead the prayers. And then sometimes he would give a talk to the, to the companions. Um, or he would visit a house of a companion. And then, he's a, um, uh, you know, he would, um, uh, and then he would come back for Isha salah. And so the daytime from basically from Fajr time until Isha time, was taken, if you want to say, was was separated into uh, two areas, right? Taking care of the governance of, of Medina. First of all, when he got to Medina, he was the governor of Medina. And then when he became the governor of all of Arabia and the leader of all of Arabia, taking care of the affairs of Arabia. And then, um, and also taking care of uh, the, uh, you know, the social issues uh, uh, and, and his family issues, right? So political issues, social issues, and family issues were kind of dealt with in that time. And then after Isha prayer, he would come home um, and then he would spend time speaking with his, with his wife, right? He would have time alone for his, for his wife. Uh, remember that he, he had multiple families to take care of. And uh, because in those families, uh, there were also children, right? Children that were in his care. So he would actually do their tarbiyah, right? So that would happen during the daytime. And so he, at nighttime, he would time, have, have time alone with his spouse. And he would actually spend time speaking and, and, and telling them stories and having some jovial, informal, lighthearted time with his, with his spouse. And then he would go to sleep. And then in, uh, uh, um, and he would only sleep... Uh, for a couple of, uh, for a little bit of time, and then he would wake up for his tahajjud prayer, for his qiyam. And that qiyam would last long, right? Um, you know, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha tells us about his qiyam. Uh, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa qiyam inside Ramadan and outside of Ramadan was not more than eight, uh, was not more than 11 rak'at, which means eight rak'at of qiyam and uh, three rak'at of witr. Um, and so that was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa qiyam. But his qiyam used to be so long that his feet would become swollen. Right? And his feet would crack because of the long time that he spent reciting Qur'an. And he would enjoy reciting Qur'an. Right? He would enjoy reciting Qur'an before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would cry. Sometimes he would read one verse and he'd cry for a long time. Right? One time, uh, a companion by the name of Hudayfa radiallahu anhu decides to spend, uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, he would always do it on his own. Most of the time it would be done inside of his house. Sometimes he would do it outside of his house. Um, there's an area known as the Musallat Tahajjud, the prayer, uh, Tahajjud prayer area of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and he would, uh, he, would sit, he would stand there and pray his tahajjud salah. And so only very rarely would a companion be able to uh, get time to actually come and spend, uh, you know, be able to see him. First of all, uh, they wouldn't know when he would do that. But uh, when, only on two, three occasions do we find that companions join him. And 
Hudayfa radiallahu anhu speaks about his, uh, his experience. He says that I stood up with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He started Surah Al-Baqarah. I thought, okay, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is going to read about a, a couple of ayat and he's going to go into ruku. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa started reciting and reciting. And every time he came to an ayah of, of, of rewards and jannah, he would, he would make dua to Allah for jannah. And every time he came to an ayah that talked about punishments or jahannam, he would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from, from, from the punishment of jahannam. And like that he read, he goes, okay, I thought he's going to read a hundred ayat and he's going to stop, which is about, uh, you know, uh, one Jews or just over Jews. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued and he finished Surah Al-Baqarah, which is 244 ayat, right? And he finished the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is about two and, a, uh, two and a half Jews. And he thought, okay, he's going to go into Ruku now. But he didn't, right? He went on, right? And, uh, you know, he went on and he went into uh, Surah Ali Imran and he continued Surah Ali Imran and he finished Surah Ali Imran and then he finished Surah Al-Nisa. And almost five, six Jews in one night, the Prophet ﷺ was reading. And, uh, and Hudayfa radiallahu anhu couldn't take it. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, one time I was uh, you know, with the Prophet ﷺ, I saw the Prophet ﷺ leading to, praying to, to Hajjud, so I decided to perform. And you know, he was praying for so long that an evil thought came to me. And so his students asked him, what, do you, what, you, what kind of evil thought came to you? He said the evil thought of, letting, uh, you know, the, uh, of leaving the Prophet ﷺ standing and just breaking my salah and leaving. Right? And so this was d basically the daily uh, routine of the Prophet ﷺ. And so uh, that's a little bit uh, you know, centered around uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ's routine in, in, in respect of, uh, of, of his day, right? From Fajr to Isha. But uh, alongside with that, we have to talk about um, the you know, specific elements of the Prophet ﷺ's life that uh, you know, I kind of highlighted with the, with the hadith of Khadija radiallahu anha, where she talks about the Prophet وسلم, was going to be meticulous with his time and, uh, and, and be able to fulfill all of the tasks that were necessary. Right? And so uh, you know, when the Prophet وسلم, himself mentions, uh, the, the Aisha radiallahu anha mentions that the, that, the, that the behavior and character and the habits of a person were not, uh, or, or, or only those habits and, and character were pleasing to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa upon which a person was consistent. Right? Upon which a person was consistent. So the Prophet ﷺ was very consistent. He, would, he was consistent in the fact that he would visit everybody who was sick. He was consistent in the fact that he would take care of every single political affair. He was consistent in the fact that he would always help those people that were in need. He was consistent in the fact that he would spend a lot. And that was uh, you know, where we come to in Ramadan. How did his Ramadan habit change from his daily habit? Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha mentions that the Prophet wasallam's Ibadat, his acts of worship would intensify. That was what, it, what changed. As far as his routine, it would be the same. Right? His Fajr, till, uh, till, uh, fajr routine would be exactly the same, except that his Ibadat, his, his, his acts of worship would intensify. So we learned that in one, one, uh, one year, the Prophet ﷺ did I'tikaf, stayed in the masjid, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, which is uh, the special act of worship of I'tikaf. He stayed in, the, uh, in I'tikaf for an entire month to seek Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. And that was the year that he found out that, uh, that Laylatul Qadr was only going to be in the 10 nights. So he did it for the first 20 nights. Then he made an announcement that, you know, uh, whoever did it for the first 20 days with me, they should continue doing it for the last 10 days as well. And so uh, that was one element to the Prophet ﷺ's Ramadan that would be different from his normal day. He was already particular with his worship, right? He would have supplications for every moment. Uh, but worship to, to the Prophet ﷺ was not limited to just physical, you know, direct ibadah. Direct ibadah was one element of worship, like performing salah, fasting. The Prophet ﷺ would fast three days, uh, would fast Mondays and Thursdays of every month, uh, of every, every week, sorry. And then he would fast the 13th, 14th, and 15th of the lunar month on top of that. So that would equal almost 15 days of fasting in the month, right, approximately. And so that would be the Prophet ﷺ's habit with his fasting on, on, a, on a daily basis, right, on a weekly basis, right. So he would fast one day, then he wouldn't fast two days, right. Uh, and, uh, and then he would, on top of that fast the three days uh, of the month. And then when it came to his ger generosity, the Prophet ﷺ's generosity, you know, the, you know, he became an, a, a parable, an example, uh, or he became a, a metaphor for, for generosity, right? Uh, that was what the Prophet ﷺ was like. You know, the, uh, you know, the poet says, right, and uh, the, the, poet was, uh, the uh, po poem was used to describe his generosity, that Lola, uh, Lola oh, my voice is glitching. Sorry. Um, okay. Sometimes maybe the, the internet connection might get a little disturbed, but inshallah, jazakallah khair for bringing that to my attention. But 
Uh, so the Prophet's generosity, right? The poet says, right? That if it wasn't for the fact that there was a la in tashahud, meaning that you have to, when we say tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawat wa tayyibat, you say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, la means no. So he says, the poet says that if it wasn't for the fact that there was a la in tashahud where he had to say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and la ilaha illallah, that's where he had to say the la. Every single time he, was, he, he would speak, it would be a yes. Meaning that he was so generous with everything that he would say yes to everything. Anybody that came for anything, he would give it to them. So much so that there were so many times in his life where he didn't have anything to give. And there were instances in which he actually borrowed to be able to give, right? To be able to fulfill somebody's needs. But that's not, uh, you know, uh, that's a very, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a, more of a difficult sunnah. A person should be careful in the way that they, uh, that, that they are generous. The Quran itself says that a person shouldn't, you know, uh, you know, spend so much that they now start, you know, blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And then they, you know, now they become somebody in need themselves. The Prophet sallallahu was never in need. He was always an independent person. He never took from people. So much so that three days would go by that he didn't have anything to eat. And none of the companions would even know that he didn't have anything to eat for three Three days, three whole months would go by. His, uh, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha says that three months would go by and nothing was cooked in our home because there was nothing to cook. And so he, her nephew asks that, uh, you know, oh, 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 aunt, how did you guys survive? She said, well, we survived on dates and water, right? That was what they survived on. So the Prophet sallallahu generosity. And then uh, that was outside of Ramadan. When that was outside of Ramadan, then uh, the, uh, the hadith mentions that the Kana Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwadun nas. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous of people. Wa ajwadu ma yakunu fi Ramadan. And he was even more generous in Ramadan. Now, how can the most generous person become even more generous? I don't know, but that's how it's described, right? Kana ajwadun nas, right? Those of you that are students of the Arabic language, you would know that ajwad is an ismut tafdil and an nas is this ismu dafilay, and that means that it's the superlative degree, the most generous of people, generous of all of humans, right? And wa kana ajwadu ma yakunu fi Ramadan, and he was even more generous when it was Ramadan. Hina yalqahu Jibreel, because in Ramadan he would actually meet with Jibreel alayhi salam, and in, in meeting with Jibreel alayhi salam he would revise the Quran with him, and that meaning would be so uh, was so beautiful to him, and he enjoyed it so much that that would increase his generosity. Right, so that was the pro the Prophet sallallahu generosity in Ramadan, and now. The, when it comes to that principle of generosity, because we're talking about the Prophet ﷺ, and a person might feel like, oh look, that's the way to be generous. No, you have to be careful with your, with your expenditure. You have to, Islam is a practical religion, it's pragmatic. It doesn't tell a person to do something that makes them, you know, uh, you know one time a person came to the Prophet ﷺ and gave him uh, two, two gold coins and said, oh Prophet of Allah, or one gold coin, sorry, and he said, oh Prophet of Allah, I want to donate this and this is all that I have. So the Prophet ﷺ got angry. And he, he, he threw that gold coin and he said, you know, now you're giving this, tomorrow you're going to start begging. Because not everybody has the capability of giving everything away and then you know, being fine with that. So, no, you should give that which you can, be, uh, which you can give and not beg. Right? It doesn't make you blame Allah. It doesn't start making you think, oh, why did I give this away? I shouldn't have given this away because now I needed it myself and now I'm going to have to figure out how to live my life without it. Well, you know, that wasn't the way that Islam wanted you to behave in the first place. So be balanced in, 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 your, in your actions. And that was the other element to it. The Prophet wasallam said, الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْقَلْ The most beloved actions to Allah are those which are done consistently, even if they are few. So do them properly, right? Be... be, be, be meticulous in your habits, right? Do them properly. And what was interesting about him, about the Prophet ﷺ was that everybody spoke about him in the same way. You know, we talked about earlier that his habits were such that, you know, we see that, you know, he used to assist in all goods, he used to take care of his relatives, he, uh, you, know, uh, you know, even his enemies and his closest family members would say the same thing about him. There was no difference when it came to how they spoke about him. Like meaning that, you know, he wasn't a different person inside of the home. He wasn't a different person in the face of the enemies. He wasn't a different person, uh, you know, with his relatives. He wasn't a different person when he, when people addressed, addressed him as Prophet of Allah. And then a different person when, some, when, when his child, uh, when his uh, daughter would call him father. He wasn't a different person. He was the same person. Everybody would see the same life within him, right? So that's very challenging. Right, uh, and so that his habits were were of this nature. Right, that he he would uh, you know eat you know little 
he wouldn't he wasn't uh, somebody that was uh, you know that was that ate a lot right he didn't have a habit of feasting right we learned that uh, no, the, you know Aisha radiallahu anha mentions that the prophet sallallahu alaihi used to like meat but he never he rarely got meat to eat he used to generally eat uh, very simple food right uh, she, she she after the prophet sallallahu alaihi death one day she was she started crying and she was asked why are you crying she said you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi didn't even get barley bread and you know barley is much more uh, coarse right as uh, you know, in, in as, as a grain right and it's more coarse and harder to digest and so she said the pro uh, you know it's not like the flour that we have that's sifted and and very fine Barley flour is very coarse. And so she said, uh, and so it's supposed to be easier to get and easier to deal with. But she said, the Prophet ﷺ didn't even get barley bread twice in a day that could fill his stomach. Right? If he got it once, he didn't get it the second time. Right? That's what his. So he had a, a very simple eating habit. Right? And he used to see, I eat the way a slave eats. Right? Yeah, he, used to, he used to sit easily, simply, and eat and, 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 and a very simple life. Right, and so simple living was part of his character, was part of his habits. Right, it was part of his routine. He used to live a very simple life, and so not, not didn't have too many formalities. Right, uh, he had uh, the ability to uh, you know separate time for everybody. Right, that was part of his uh, his routine. Right, uh, he would find time for everybody. Right, and so he had time for the child. You know, uh, the Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu who was a uh, who was a person who who served him and assisted him. His younger brother passed away. Oh, sorry, no, his, his younger brother did pass away, but before he passed away, that young bro boy, uh, Omer, had a little pet uh, bird, and that bird, bed, pet bird died. And so the Prophet Sallallahu went to console this young little companion. He was, a, he was only a young child, maybe a, two years old, right? And he went to console this young child, right? He had time to go and console this young child, right? That was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a governor of Medina. And he had time to go and tell a, a young boy in his community whose pet bird died, he had time to go and, con he, he, he made it a point to go and console him, right? That's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And so, um, you know, the poet says, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, how can we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's virtues, right? And, uh, uh, you know, Shahid al anamu bi fadlihi hatta al that, um, you know, uh, humans, humankind has, uh, has uh, bore witness to his virtues even his enemies bore witness to his virtues. حَتَّى الْعِدَاءُ وَالْفَضْلُ مَا شَهِدَتْ بِهِ الْأَعْدَاءُ A true virtue is the one that is expressed by your enemy. The people who like you are always going to say good things about you. But when your enemy speaks good about you, then it's kind of interesting. And so in, the, in, in, in Bukhari, we learn about, uh, about uh, the, you know, the description or the, the way that the Prophet is described by Abu Sufyan, who was, who radiallahu anhu, later became a Muslim. But at that moment, he was actually the person who hated Islam. He was the leader of the Meccans who hated Islam. And he was in front of the Roman king and he had to describe the Prophet ﷺ. And if you read the description of the Prophet ﷺ, that this enemy of Islam at that moment, because he later becomes a Sahabi, but the enemy is giving to the Roman, Roman king. Both of them are non-Muslim. And one is speaking to the other, and it's the same that you're going to find what, what, his, what his close family members are going to say about him. So, number one, one of the lessons that we can definitely take is that the Prophet ﷺ structured his day around his prayer times. Number two, that the Prophet ﷺ was very meticulous with du'as. You know, connecting himself, keeping himself conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three was that the Prophet ﷺ sorted out his time so that he had time for people. And number four was that the Prophet ﷺ was consistent with all of his actions. Right? Was consistent with all of his actions. Um, and so these are the, some of the lessons that we can definitely learn with. The Prophet ﷺ lived a simple life. The Prophet ﷺ was generous. He wasn't attached to the world. And so he had time for, for, for you know, uh, he was able to give uh, things very easily. Um, and uh, basically, those are a few points that we can reflect over. Um, you know, and then again, that when it came to Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ's daily routine would just become intensified with worship. That was what would happen. And his generosity would increase. Uh, that was what would happen. Um, and so, um, that was basically uh, what we learned about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are a few points I think we can uh, kind of stop with. If anybody has any specific questions uh, with regards to his day, uh, I could try to help you with, uh, with that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to pinpoint specific and go into specific uh, habits of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and speak about them on a specific level because that it's al alone would be a session on its own. Uh, so I try to keep them in a broad sense and cover them. Uh, so that way we learn about it. Uh, those of you that know Arabic, uh, you're welcome to try and find that. It's easy to find that book. Um, and even this uh, website, um, the, the Pro uh, Productive Muslim, 
uh, has this, uh, you know, uh, routine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And like I said, uh, you know, when we talk about Ramadan and outside of Ramadan, there's not much difference except that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's acts of worship would intensify. Otherwise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had about seven Ramadans in his life, right? Seven or nine Ramadan, sorry, I would say in his life. Because Ramadan uh, became compulsory in the second year after Hijrah, and he passes away in the 11th year of Hijrah. So there's about nine Ramadans. Out of those nine Ramadans, one of them, you have to remember, goes in the Battle of Badr. So uh, that's another example. Maybe that's something else that we could uh, talk about as well. That the Prophet Wasallam, you know, it's a political affair. It's a political issue taking care of protecting Medina. Um, and uh, uh, so the Battle of Badr takes place in the second year after Hijrah uh, in Ramadan, in 17, on the 17th of Ramadan. So he has to travel to Badr, which is, uh, which is uh, maybe, uh, how many, about uh, uh, a hundred, more than 100 kilometers away. Um, and so it's a long distance for them because they're walking there. Uh, and then the Battle of Uhud takes place the next year in Shawwal, so right after Ramadan. And so the preparations have to be made in Ramadan. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the conquest of Mecca takes place in the eighth year uh, of Hijrah, which also takes place in Ramadan, so he has to travel to Mecca in Ramadan. And so the Prophet ﷺ has these situations in which he has to take care of serious work. And, the, and, and Ramadan was not that he didn't take care of serious work, right? He took care of his serious work. Uh, so uh, maybe, uh, you know, while keeping our... You know, first of all, you know, structuring our day would be one of the greatest lessons that we can take. And then putting our habits according to, you know, figuring out those habits that we need to, that make a person's life productive, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and being consistent with them. And being particular with the amount of them, right? Uh, uh, and then uh, structuring them around the, 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 the salah times. Right, um, and so even if you have to go to school, even if you have to go to work, you, when you wake up, you have an idea that this is when salah times are going to be taking place, and this is when I'm going to be doing what. So I have to go to school at this time, and zohar time is going to take place. So after fajr, I'm going to be going to school. I'm going to be ending uh, still in school at zohar time. I'm going to be coming home before asr time. So uh, it's not like oh, I go to school at eight and come back uh, come back at three. It's rather I go to school after fajr and come back before asr. So it's a different way of thinking. The perspective is different. Um, and so that helps you structure what am I going to do after Fajr, what am I going to do after Dhuhr, what am I going to do after Asr, what am I going to do after Maghrib, what am I going to do after Isha? Um, and then uh, specific characteristics. Uh, again, there's too many, right? Uh, the akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to try and uh, inculcate that. And there's a beautiful book for that. Uh, it's called Shama'il al-Tirmidhi. It's also in English, uh, Shama'il al-Tirmidhi, the, the personality and character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? It's a long book, so it's not something that can be covered, obviously, in one session. But it's worthwhile acquiring. You know, in Ramadan, it might be a good idea to acquire this book. You can just uh, type up Shama'il al-Tirmidhi. Uh, Imam Tirmidhi is a great muhaddith, scholar of hadith, a student of Imam Bukhari, and he's written this book um, on the description, the physical description and the characteristics of the, characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Worthwhile acquiring and trying to put that into practice and that's where you're going to learn many of these more specific habits that I guess some people might be looking at wanting to know and read that book and, and then apply it right uh, the Prophet's habit of eating the way he dressed the way he spoke the way he walked the way he uh, interacted the way he smiled the way he laughed uh, you know these are all in that book and it's a lengthier book uh, but that's something that you can acquire Shama'il of, uh, of Imam Tirmidhi um, you can, it's, uh, I'm sure there's PDFs of it available. Um, also this book, uh, or this, uh, you know, the, the, the day of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a day in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the daily routine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is taken from that Arabic book. You can take that, inshallah, and apply that as well, inshallah. Okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, Jazakallah khairan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept whatever was said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I would uh, uh, re uh, suggest to all of us that once we've learned about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a little bit, one of the things we can do, and I'm going to, it's just a suggestion, it can't be mandatory, but uh, it's a request from myself that we all uh, take this one moment and send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama salli'ta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inna kahamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inna kahamidun majid. Allahumma